look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 In hindsight You make mistakes, we're learning from this In hindsight be your today and your tomorrow In hindsight It's so much clearer now have you ever wondered how addiction impacts not only the individual, but also their loved ones? Today on Hindsight, the podcast, I have a compelling story to share. Our guest is Al Richards, host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Al's journey through addiction, his battle to reclaim his life, and his dedication to helping others is nothing short of inspiring. From losing his job due to substance abuse to finding the strength to turn his life around, Al has faced incredible challenges. Now, he shares his story and insights to break the stigma of addiction and support others on their journey to recovery. Welcome to the show, Al. How are you doing this morning, sir? Late, man. I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Uh, where are you calling in from? Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. How, so I'm over here in California, and it is blazing hot. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it's going clear across the country, but Salt Lake City, I don't know. How is the temperatures over there? You know, the last few days, it has been very pleasant. However, they are definitely starting to warn us that this week, I mean, we're talking 106, 105. That's what they're saying to get ready for so yeah we're yeah. it's heading our way as well <laughs> yeah it's it's i'll tell you what it is blazing hot oh my lord i know i'm not in palm springs i'm i'm in a town called marietta but in palm springs they said it was 123 degrees yesterday so uh god bless them anywho <laughs> uh, yeah no kidding right <laughs> <laughs> hey so this is hindsight the podcast and you know the real mission of the podcast is for me to come in uh invite some guests some good friends of mine to come on talk about their experiences through their lives right some good some bad and to look at their decisions they made and how it kind of made them who they are today right we all go through different challenges we all take different choices and dis decisions and it kind of navigates our trajectory and sometimes we get a little lost right and it seems like you have a story of you know through your life's journey where you got just a little bit lost now you've recovered and you're bringing a lot of other lost souls along with you so we talked a little bit about drug abuse was it was a drug abuse or just alcoholism no it was also drugs yeah okay so both so before we jump into why I got there, like what was the turning point that made you realize that you needed to change your life? You know, that's a, that's a really good question, Lee. You know, it happened about 15 mm -hmm. years ago, back in 2009. And I ended up walking into work one day, a place that I had been employed for 24 years and was asked to do a UA. I hadn't been UA in 15 years. And yeah. when you spend every Friday and Saturday night snorting cocaine and drinking, it doesn't go out of your mm -hmm. system. It stays in your system. And of course, I failed the UA. And I, I really do believe that if the original owner would have still had the company, if he wouldn't have sold it a year before that, I would probably still have a job because I was a model mm -hmm. employee, didn't miss a day of work. I was there whether I was sick or not. You know, it was just my party time was every Friday and Saturday night. And that's what changed it. You know, I I lost my job, okay. something that I gave my life to. And I had a friend call me up and he goes, he goes, you know, it, we're hearing that you lost your job, man, this sucks. And, and he was honest with me and he said, you know, you're a person that people didn't really trust. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what, what do you mean they didn't trust me? He says, well, you, you were known as a liar and a manipulator. I'm like, no, no, that's not me. No way. Mm -hmm. After doing some soul searching, I realized he was 100% correct. And losing my job really was a blessing in disguise. I mean, I lost my house, ended up losing all my retirement just to try to stay afloat. But again, it was mm -hmm. a blessing because it really woke me up and really got me searching deep inside here. To go, who am I really? Am I really this person who I think I am? And my answer was, I'm not. And yeah. that's when I started making my shift. Got you. 
So what made you, if you can pinpoint it, what made you start with uh, the addictions? Well, gosh, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it up. Yeah. I, in, in, in 1981, I graduated from high school <clears throat> and went out and started working construction and started here in Salt Lake City, ended up getting transferred to Colorado met up with some other guys that we all worked construction. They were all from different states, different areas. And, you know, 17 years old. And, and when you're working your butt off all through the week, we, we played just as hard on the weekends. You know, we tons mm -hmm. of beer, uh, lots of alcohol, lots of drugs. We're talking acid, mushrooms, hash, Coke, pot, you know, and it was just a weekend thing. And then we'd go back to work. When I was in Colorado, all my friends decided to take off to go to a bar that night in Greeley, Colorado. And I, I didn't, I wasn't interested in going. So one of my other buddies came over and, and uh, he's like, Hey, where's your saucers? And I told him and he goes and gets a saucer and pulls out this little paper envelope and starts I'm like, what, what the hell's that? And he goes, Oh, this is Coke. You want some? I'm like, no, mm. no, 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 I don't want to do this. Cause yeah. John Belushi had just passed away like a couple months before mm. of an overdose with cocaine. And I, did, I didn't yeah. want anything to do with it. Well, as the night went on and he and I kept drinking, finally, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, let me try one of these. Immediately, right. Lee, I fell in love. I mean, seriously, I fell in mm. love. And yeah. not realizing what that first line of cocaine was going to do to my life years, years down the road. And I dabbled in it here and there. It was nothing that was something I had to have all the time. It was like once in a great while. And mm -hmm. I ended up going to Kentucky for three years with the, with the company that I was working with, helped got to get a plan up and going. I worked seven days a week for a year and a half straight. And I'm, that's no lie. I was working 16, yeah. 17 hours a day. Saturday, I'd work about six. Sunday, I'd work about four. And mm -hmm. had a lot of stress, a lot of pressure under me to get the production up and going, train the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And... I had an opportunity to do it there and I dabbled in it just a little bit. Ended up three years later getting transferred back to Salt Lake. And they just started piling the responsibility on me. And I was asking for it. Yeah. And yeah. before I knew it, it was way too much. And I lived and breathed my job. I couldn't even go home and enjoy an evening at home with my wife because I was constantly thinking of what needed to be done the next day. Went to a party. And um, this guy that my wife knew said, hey, do you party? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm at your party. Apparently I do party. And he's like, no, you know, <laughs> do you party? And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah, I know what you, my gosh, yeah, it's been a long time. And yeah. went out in the back room and did a couple lines. For the first time, Lee, in years, I had completely forgot about work. That night at that party, wow. work wasn't even right. in my mind at all. Yeah. And how our minds work, right? We're thinking, oh my gosh, I finally got to relax. I was chilled. And before I knew mm. it, I called the guy up and said, hey, do you know where I can get some of this? And he goes, yeah, for me, I sell it. And yeah. not realizing it was like once in a while here, every once in a great while there. Before I knew it, Lee, it was every weekend. And I did it for a total of eight years. And a matter of fact, um, my last wife wow. here, who we just divorced after 18 years last year, mm -hmm. because that's a whole different story. But the three years we dated, yeah. she did not even know I was snorting cocaine. She knew I was drinking because she drank with me, and it was social drinking. We didn't drink to get drunk. Right, right. We just social drank, and yeah, it just took over my life. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's, well, you know, that's sad and i and I, the reason why i say that they're, they're all all the cases are uh you know troubling i guess you, you said 81 so it's a different time back then as well uh when you graduated from high school uh then it is now there's like a lot of news about it or information about the addictions and stuff like that i yeah. remember when i was in school i was in elementary school back in the time and nancy reagan said just say no Right. And for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, that kind of stuck with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, you know, but understanding the part, I didn't party a lot as well. Um, so maybe that kind of, you know, kept me out of it. I was a little shy, you know, when I grew up. So, 
Uh, just making some comparisons. I, I think I graduated in 88, so we're around the same age frame, uh, same time frame. I'm babbling on about it because I'm trying to take that in. There really was no trauma. There, there was just having a good time. And progressively, it got worse, right? So this one guy, he introduced you to cocaine, and now he's a, he's a seller, right? So that's the classic, um, you know, get you hooked onto it and, and, and go from there. How fast or how increasing, you say you only did it on the weekends. Was it always only on the weekends, or did you have to find time during the week so that you can move away from work, not think about work? Right? Like, how did, how did that work for you through those eight years? No, seriously, it was just the weekends. Yeah, and, and okay, I had good. a lot. I've good. had a lot of people call BS on it, and I'm like, no, I'm I'm up front. I'm mm -hmm. being honest with you. It was, you know, I'd work yeah. twelve, thirteen, fourteen hours Monday through Thursday. Friday came, yeah, and no matter how hard I tried to tell myself, okay, not this weekend, not this weekend, not this weekend. One o'clock, one thirty would hit. Man, I'm on the cell phone calling my buddy yeah. saying, hey, I'm off at three o'clock. Where can I meet you at three thirty? And I would get yeah. enough to last me through Friday and Saturday. Sunday, I'd clean my act up and go back to do the same old thing again at work. So, yeah, it, it was right. just every, an every weekend thing. So until and, you lost your – go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, and as far as trauma, you mentioned trauma because a lot of the guests that come on my show as well have battled with some kind of childhood mm -hmm. trauma, accident. I mean, mental illness, whatever it may be. and And – I mean, I didn't live really a bad childhood. It was pretty a normal childhood. Yeah. My dad was pretty hard on me. And I've oh, really yeah. gone back and started thinking. I, I think I had a lot of that stuff bottled up inside of me as well. However, I'm not really pinpointing my addiction to that. It was basically just I yeah. could not deal with the stress anymore. And that was my way of releasing it. Yeah. So you had a taste of them when you were young. You knew how it made you feel. And then later on, uh, it, it came back to you. I understand that. Yeah. Um, what were, so, so my original question was, so when you, you didn't realize that it was an issue until you were fired. Is that, is that fair? You know, you know, and I'm really glad that you asked that Lee, because <laughs> the weekends was getting bad. I mean, mm -hmm. I would, I, I played that, 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 um, scale all night long. You know, when I'd start getting too high, mm -hmm. I was drinking more alcohol to level it up. And then when I was starting to get too drunk, I was starting more, more cocaine to level it up. Yeah. I remember walking into the restroom in, in our master bedroom and, um, all of a sudden, man, I just went down, fell in the tub, mm. took the shower curtain. My wife and one of her friends came in and, and I'm laying in the tub. And they're like, what the heck went on? I, you know, I, I don't know. And yeah. I remember there was quite a few weekends, Lee, where I was looking at myself in the mirror going, God, please help me. Because mm. I knew that if I kept going that direction, it could do more damage yeah. to me. And, and for me to fall in the tub and luckily fall away from hitting my head, you know, on the faucet yeah. or anything like that. I mean, I could have broke my neck. All kinds of things could have happened. I think mm -hmm. that was kind of like one of my warning shots that God shot over yeah. my bow. And okay. Yeah, it just I I just kept asking for his help and someone who have all who has always stayed physical fit pretty much throughout my whole life, I had let myself go. I was up to 198 pounds, never weighed that much my whole life. And mm -hmm. here I am out of shape, partying every weekend. And when I do my public speaking, I, I like to say God has a sense of humor because when I asked for his help, I lost my job. And that's not what I was looking mm. for. But that's the direction he that's knew what I you needed to, go to wake me up. Yep. Yeah. Man. So I'll tell you what, how, you know, that that's traumatic. So one, you lose your job. This is what you've known and what you've been and who you've associated yourself with. How did you find the strength to face and overcome? your addiction at that moment like that was your sign you lost your job so did you spiral and start doing more or did you know at that moment like this is i have to change no i i knew you know i i battled mm -hmm. after i lost my job i went into about excuse me about a two-week depression and yeah. my wife really helped with that you know i mean 
I lost my job a month and a half after her and I got married. A month and oh, a half. Oh, wow. And yeah. you can imagine what that yeah. did to her. She finally found a man that had a stable job, was at his job a long time. A month and a half after we get married, boom, he lost his job because of a drug I was doing without her even knowing. She didn't even know so about it, right? She had no clue. And then I had to put my tail between my legs and tell her. And, you know, she stuck by my side. And it's just that light switch went off. I, I did not have to go to any rehabs. Nothing. I, yeah. I could feel that I was detoxing because when the weekends would come, I'd get really shaky. Not during the week, but on the weekends, I'd get real mm -hmm, shaky and mm -hmm. get really irritated which it mm -hmm. took me a while to figure out why I was getting that way. And it was because I had done this normal act for eight years and then I'm not doing it. Yeah. And mm. I really, you know, someone, someone who grew up LDS, I got out of the church when I was about 13 and mm -hmm. I've always believed in God and Jesus, mm -hmm. but I really lost that connection. Yeah. And after about a two week, two and a half week of depression and that something told me I needed to pray and it took me a little bit. And I finally hit my knees at the side of my bed and started mm. praying. I'm just bawling at the same time. And I'm going, God, this is not what I was asking for. What am I going to do now? And literally it was just to keep moving forward. So I decided to do some really heavy soul searching to find out who okay. Al Richards really was as an individual. And the more soul searching I did, the more I realized, hell, I don't like this guy either. He's a liar. He's a manipulator. Mm. All he cares about is himself. You know, if he doesn't get his way, he'll do everything he can to get his way. It doesn't matter who he has to hurt, yeah. who he has to push out of the way, as long as I get what I want. And yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. And I've already just disappointed my new wife. And I don't want to be that type mm -hmm. of husband either. And I just started, just started going down a different road. And as being a spiritual person now, I don't really, I don't really push a religion. I'm more of a spiritual person. God's just started placing the right people in front of me. I started meeting some really amazing people and to throw a stick in the spokes. When we lost our house in 2010, my wife went into her addiction. She fell into alcoholism and she, she's yeah. still battling it to this day. And even though we were together 18 years and she went two and a half years clean last July, she relapsed right before my 60th birthday. And that's when I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't continue to stand by your side, watching you spiral out of control while I'm doing everything yeah. I can to continue to better my life. And, and I'm still a friend. We're still friends. I still do what I can to support her through her journey. Right. But uh, yeah, I just, I just said, I'm done. I just threw in the towel and took off in a totally different direction. I tell you, you, you mentioned how you had to do some soul search and you had to look in the mirror, you had to figure out who you were. And that's a common theme for people who want to be successful. And obviously you wanted to be successful in overcoming this addiction. How pivotal was the conversation or the 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 gentleman that came to you and said, hey, you know, people didn't trust you. How did that make you feel in that moment? You spoke on it a little bit, but just walk me through that conversation a little bit. You know, it made me feel like a piece of crap. Yeah. You know, and, and, and again, I said that I called BS on it because mm -hmm. I still didn't see myself as that type of individual. And when you start really digging down and you start tracing your steps backwards, which I've done mm -hmm. a ton in the past 15 years, yeah. connecting the dots backwards, like Steve Jobs says, if you connect your dots backwards, you'll see you're exactly where you're supposed to be this moment. And that is so true. And I just started placing, just going backwards and started realizing throughout all the years where I started to lose myself not realizing I was doing it because we're so caught up in the 3D world, right? We're looking through life at a, through a straw. We're not seeing everything out here. We're only seeing just what's in front of us. And mm -hmm. yeah, it just, uh, it just woke me up. It's, it's kind of like one of those things that if you say something to somebody and they slap you in the face real quick and you're just kind of like, what? Yeah. What just happened? That's, that's yeah. what it was like for me. Wow. Wow. But that was key. So that's good. Sometimes you need to have the hard truth told to you, especially by someone who you 
who you maybe trust or maybe, you know, you respect, you respect their words. Right. And I think that was probably maybe it was malicious, but it seems like a good friend uh, who was who was really telling you the real, you know, how they saw you and not necessarily how you saw yourself. Because to your point, it is hard to see yourself when you're out there, um, you know, looking at the world through a straw. You know, you're seeing it from your perspective. You're not seeing the different people who you're affecting. You're just seeing what you want and you're going after it and getting it. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, that's a, that's trust. And, and on that, can you, st- you know, you said you just went cold Turkey in a sense, right. But can you share any specific strategies or support systems that were crucial in your recovery process? You know, I, I've been asked that question a few times, you know, a lot of people when they're in their yeah. recovery, you know, they, they go to a rehabilitation or they go to some type of different type of program, whatever may work for them, or they, they go into the church or religion or with me, I've heard of AA. However, it never okay. even really popped into my head or CA yeah. cocaine anonymous. None of that even popped into my head at all. Okay. When I was doing that soul searching, the only thing that I knew was fitness. That's the only thing that I could think of, okay, I got to get myself back in shape. I got to figure out which direction I'm going to go. And I don't know except this. And that's mm-hmm. what I did. I, I jumped on a mountain bike that my wife had bought me for Christmas. And I just started riding around the block. Months down the road, next thing I was doing five miles, six miles. I started losing weight. Yeah. I started feeling good again. Of course, now my neurons are firing better because I don't, I'm not fogged with drugs in my head. I started thinking clear, right. started focusing better. And that's pretty much kind of what got me going on the journey, not realizing that as I was stepping out of my cesspool, my wife was stepping into mm. hers. And yeah. it, uh, I just did a talk in Park City, Utah a couple of weeks ago, Lee, and I I was telling the audience, I said, you know, I didn't choose this path that I'm on. God chose it for me. There's there's no other explanation. He had to have Mm -hmm. chosen this for me because of where I'm at now in in this realm of life. It's it's crazy because as I was still searching, trying to find me, my wife was losing herself. And as a spouse to see that happening, this person that you really love and care about slowly, but surely destroy herself and destroy us Mm -hmm. as a couple, which I had already done with my addiction. And now it was just compounding. Yeah. Wow. So with that, and I know you had to separate yourself because you were trying to, you know, stay on your own track, but what advice would you give someone currently struggling with addiction? And and one thing that I will add to that is that thankfully you were able to kind of fall back on some anchors, right? Or some, some stability with religion, you know, Latter-day Saints, and then also with fitness. So you, you instinctively knew, let me get back to something, you know, that I can relate to, to kind of move this out of the way. What would you, what advice would you give to someone else who's going through it? You know, you can't do it alone. You know, I didn't even do mine mm-hmm. alone, even though I didn't go to a rehab or anything like that. And, and you know, kind of correct, too. I didn't really fall back into my religion. I just wanted to get close to God again, whatever that took. And most of it okay. was just me hitting my knees and praying because I wasn't one to want to go back to church. I did not like it. I did not care for it. It didn't fit for me. Um, yeah. But uh, we can't do it alone. You know, and, mm-hmm. and I would say reach out to someone who has done it. Because they know exactly what you're what you're going through, you know. If if you and I, Lee, live the same type of life, and you've been 15 years clean or 20 years, whatever it means, you would be the person who I would want to go to and go, man, how can I do this? I I need your help. Right. I need your support because you know what I'm going through at the beginning of my new journey. Mm-hmm. So find find a person, and, and it's hard to talk to family. It's hard to talk to friends because they don't understand it. They don't get it. Yeah. They don't understand the struggle yeah. that you're going through to fight that demon in your head that keeps forcing you to go back to this direction. Because the majority of the people that I've met in the recovery community, they didn't want to be a heroin addict. 
They didn't want to be addicted right, to porn. Right. They didn't want to be addicted to gambling or eating, whatever it may be. It's just life took them there. And now the talons of the eagle's claws are buried so deep. They just don't know how to get out of it. When you right. have a really good support system, man, that, that changes everything. And really, really it just changes your life. So I would just say, look yeah. for a really good support system and, don't fall on people who don't understand it because all it will do is compound the issue to yeah. you know, make it worse. Because again, you're, they're going to tell you things you don't want to hear or that you already know and that they don't understand. So when you say family, do you mean like siblings and, you know, stuff like that? Or are you talking about your, your immediate, your wife and, and do you have kids? Yeah, I have two daughters grown. They're grown women. They're both in two their daughters, 30s. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what type of family and, and, you know, for the case of the, what you just said, it really doesn't matter. It's just the people that are there to support you. But in your case, uh, which family were you referring to? So, so really my family was, was people who God was putting in front of me that ended up okay. really being like my that. new family. And I like that. Let me, okay. So I'll explain a little better so people understand mm -hmm. when, when my, I kept my addiction hidden for a long time. I didn't even start talking about it mm -hmm. until January of last year on my show for the very first time. Okay. I was sharing more of my wife's story, which really wasn't for me to tell. It was for her to tell. But again, it was another thing that I didn't quite understand. When I mm -hmm. had a friend sit down with me at a coffee shop and he's like, Al, what the heck's going on? And when I told him what I was battling with with my spouse, He's the one that said, Al, you need to start talking about it. You need to start sharing this. And when I yeah. said, well, who wants to listen to my soft story? Oh, feel sorry for Al because his wife's an alcoholic. He goes, no, because there's other people going through the same thing. You know, Lee, we have this problem as human beings that when something traumatic is happening in our life, we have a way of thinking we're the only ones in this world that's going through it. <laughs> There's know, seven to eight billion people in this world, and we're the only ones out of that many people that are suffering from this. There's other individuals. So when I finally started opening up about it, started doing some public speaking about it, there were people that I have known for years through networking that was pulling me off to the side going, can I talk to you in private? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. and we'd go off into a room or down the hall somewhere, and they're like, Al, I know you've known me for about eight years, but you probably didn't know I was a heroin addict. I'd be like, what? Holy crap, you, mm. you got to be kidding me. And it seemed like no mm -hmm. matter, once I opened up that can of worms, it was coming at me from every direction. People I met at the grocery stores, people that I met at the gym, people that I met at movies, people that I met at gas stations, convenience stores. It didn't matter where I went. I'd start a conversation with somebody. They were there as mm. well. So that's what I'm talking about family, because I was able okay. to start talking to individuals who have been in that circle, in that box of addiction, whether they were a family member of a loved one or they were in it themselves. And that's yeah. where really my support really started coming from, because even back then, my mom and dad didn't even know I was doing it. I mean, that's how well mm. it was hidden. And a lot of addicts and alcoholics can hide their addiction really, really well. Yeah. Wow. So what would you say to families currently dealing with a loved one's addiction? It seems like, you, you know, you have a very good story where you were aware of a lot of things and you listened to different, you know, insights. Like someone said, hey, you know, you, you can't be trusted. So you took that to heart. Can I be trusted? You went deeper. Uh, someone said, Hey, you need to go out and talk about this. And you did it. And you started finding other people to build that, that village, right. That you can all support each other. So from your perspective, what is something that families need to know when they're dealing with someone who's necessary, maybe not necessarily where you're at, right? Do you understand the question? Yeah, I, I believe so. And I think, I think you do. Yeah. You know, let the individual know how much you care for them. Let them know you mm -hmm. love them, that they mean the world to mm -hmm. you. Because a person that's suffering an addiction, and it doesn't matter what type of addiction it is, the brain fires the exact same way. 
to yeah. let them know that that you're there for them. However, mm -hmm. you have to set boundaries, and this is one of the hardest hardest things to do is set boundaries, especially. Mine was my spouse, but if it's your child, it's hard to push your mm. child away. That's a whole different yeah. sandbox that you're playing in right there. However, you still have to set those boundaries. And if you do not stick by them, all you're doing is just throwing threats out there. And eventually those threats don't mean anything to the individual that you're doing your best to help. And I would also say, yeah. dig deep. Do everything you can to educate yourself about addiction so you can understand just a little bit more of what your loved one is going through. Because when you tell them, why can't you stop? I can just have one or two drinks and stop. Yeah. Why, why do you have to drink so much till you finally pass out? I don't understand. Well, you don't understand. And you will never understand until you step foot in their shoes. However, if you get to yeah. understand just a little bit of it, it helps you open up your mind just enough to go, okay. And, and it's hard because you do have to push them out of your life. You really do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, would mm -hmm. tell, I would tell my ex, it's like, as long as you are sober, you need help. I'll do everything I can to stand by your side and help you. However, yeah. if you come to me and you're drunk, I don't want anything to do with you. I still love you and you still mean the world to me. Yeah. We have mm -hmm. to love each other from a distance right now. Boundaries. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good advice. Great advice, actually. So let's talk about the other side of addiction podcast. What, what inspired you to start the podcast? My, um, my wife's battle with alcoholism and mm -hmm. all the mistakes, what we just got done talking about, Lee, all the mistakes mm -hmm. I made as a spouse. I probably... Nice. Yeah. I probably, if, if I may say this, I probably pissed more fuel on the fire than I did putting water on it, in all honesty. Mm. And again, it's because I did not understand addiction. And okay. I was my wife's addiction therapist without having the credentials to prove that I was an addiction therapist. Because yeah. again, I didn't know anything about, about addiction. So. Okay. What gave me the idea is I, I, when I first started doing public speaking, I had a lot of people coming up to me going, oh, my gosh, this story is amazing. And mm -hmm. I did my last talk in February of 2020. We all know what happened in March of 2020. The freaking world shut down. No more gatherings. And I had already had a couple talks already planned throughout mm -hmm. 2020. What I like to say, my spirit kept saying, there's something you need to do. There's something you need to do. You need to figure it out. You need to figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And then um, in January or February or so of 2021, or yeah, 2020 into 2021, I, I started mm -hmm. hearing about podcasts and I really didn't know what a podcast was. And it took all through pretty much um, through, thousand, two, through 2021 before the idea finally kicked. And I went, oh, my gosh, what if I started a podcast and called it The Other Side of Addiction? Because those who are going in recovery are trying to get to the other side of addiction. And those of loved ones who have family members that are battling addiction are on the other side of addiction. Mm -hmm. and Again, God just started placing the right people in front of me. And the purpose of doing it, number one, is I started realizing the stigma behind addiction. Yeah. I wanted to yeah. have a voice about it. And I also was hoping to, through my words, let other people know the mistakes I made with my wife, mm -hmm. hoping that they wouldn't make those same mistakes. And that's really what got that ball rolling. Do you still have challenges with addiction now? Or do you think you're solid? No. No. It's uh Yeah. Life's just freaking amazing right now. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really is. I, I'm not where I really where I want to be. However, it's my journey and I know my journey is my journey. And mm -hmm. I just let I just let 
my higher power, which is God for me. I just let him lead the way. And sometimes I find myself yeah. going off in a different direction. And then I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You, you know, really I don't have control here. of my life. He does. Because every time I took control of my life, all I did was freaking screw it up. So then I get myself back. And yeah, so life, life has been, life has really been good. And that urge of every Friday picking up the phone has been gone for a long, long time, which I'm very grateful for. So how is, how is sharing um, your story and the stories of others on your podcast? How has that directly impacted your own recovery? Does it reinforce it? Does it, you know, yeah, I won't put words in your mouth. It definitely reinforces it. You know, Mm -hmm. A lot of guests that come on the show that talk about their journey and now what they do is they help others in theirs. And they're like, Al, mm-hmm. really, they're helping me in my journey more than I think I'm helping them. And that's exactly what's going on with me. My guests are yeah. helping me. Whew. I get emotional a lot of times talking about this because their journey is helping me become such an incredible human being. And it's because... Mm-hmm. I was blessed enough to not go down the dark holes that a lot of my guests have gone down. I mean, I've Mm -hmm. had people on my show that lived on the streets, sold their bodies for drugs and alcohol and just ate out of dumpsters. And to see where their life's at today, people in recovery hang with them because they'll teach you a lot about life and how to enjoy life and the way to look at life because they've been on the other side. And now they're in the light and they look at life a totally different way than the rest of us do. And it's the way that I want to see it. So they are basically now my therapist. And I've had people ask me, did you go to therapy? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I says, well, as a matter of fact, I go through therapy every week when I do my shows because they're really my my therapist in, in all reality. Yeah. That's good. How do you how do you see the podcast evolving in the future? Uh, to to further help, you know, those affected by addiction. You know, I, I see this long version. The podcast has been going over three years, 286, nice. 287 episodes. People I've interviewed from nice. the UK, Canada, all across the United States. I don't know. My My main goal there for a long time was to monetize it. And mm-hmm. now after going three years... I'm still going to continue to do it as long as guests are still willing to come on and use their voice and share their story. I'm hoping down the road it will get even bigger, larger, so we can reach a larger amount of people and and hopefully help people. Because all it takes is, as you know, all it takes is change in one life. The domino effect we don't Mm -hmm. get to see, but it's like a tsunami. starts out this little ripple and then thousands of miles, hundreds of miles down the way, it's big. We may not see it. Yeah. But if mm-hmm. one person can hear your show, hear my show, anyone else's show, and change one life, the ripple effect is so huge. And and I'm hoping here by the yeah. fifth year that this thing is just so huge that, um, I mean, it's getting to the point where I got people reaching out to me to come on the show. I'm very seldom now am I yeah. looking for guests. They're they're coming to me, which is a great start. Good, good, excellent. Excellent. All right. So you named a few, but I'm going to ask you this question anyway, um, because I wouldn't be a good question asker if I didn't. (laughs) What was it for this hindsight podcast specifically? Right. But what was a significant choice that you were faced to make during the journey through the addiction? What was the choice for me to go through it? What what was a significant choice? And this is a series because it's going to start with the choice and then it's going to, you know, what was the decision? How did it, how did, you know, what influenced the decision? How, you, you know, so it's a series of questions, but one, I just want you to focus and think about one significant choice that you had to make. Uh, you were forced to make when you were going through your journey with addiction. I would say to get closer to my higher power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What influenced your decision? What made you decide that the higher power was the way? 
because I had kept him out of my life for so long. And, and it's crazy that you kneel down and pray to somebody that you don't see, Hmm. but yet you have, you know, that they're there because you feel it. Yeah. And, and I really do believe that's why I went that direction because as I said earlier in the show, we can't do it alone. Yeah. And I was embarrassed to go to anybody. I couldn't go to my family. My friends didn't even know, right? My, my friends Mm -hmm. who I hung out with now, uh, my party friends did because we partied together, but you know, the other individuals didn't. So, um, and also to add in, I wasn't the person who I thought I was. So it was kind of like that combination of everything coming together to yeah. that really open my eyes. And I hope I'm answering your questions. No, you absolutely did. And, I, and, and one common theme that I really like about your journey is that you were able to check your ego. Right. You just mentioned it. I couldn't talk to these people. I couldn't, you know, whatever. But you, you found someone to talk to. Right. You had to check your ego and you had to find that person or that group of people um, that you were comfortable with sharing this type of information and trying to seek some sort of feedback from them. Um, a lot of time, our ego will have us going in the wrong direction forever. Right. Because you're justifying that what you're doing is fine and everyone else is wrong. Um, but you, you took it on. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it was, it was at the time when you lost your job, but you still, you know, you see other people will spiral and continue to go down that road because they won't allow their ego to be put in check. Um, and, and that's a whole nother side, the psychological side, not even the addictive side. Right. Um, so yeah. that is a good lesson. Take a look, reflect, understand who you are, check your ego. Uh, you gave some good, great, great tips and lessons in that one. Uh, Al, go ahead. You were about to say something. Thank you. And can I share one one thing here, Lee, with you real quick? You sure can. Uh, talking sure about can. the ego. As I said earlier in the show, you know, I didn't even really open up and share my story until January of 2023. Mm-hmm. Again, God has a way of directing things when you when you let go of the steering wheel or throw in the towel. So me and a and a, and a beautiful young lady who was a guest on my show, we become really good friends. And we both got talking one day and we had this vision of starting a, an event that was all based around addiction, recovery, suicide, domestic violence. Mm-hmm. And we ended up holding our very first event in St. George, Utah, 350 miles south of Salt Lake City in August of 2022. And one of the gentlemen that we asked to speak to be one of the speakers was a gentleman by the name of Dave DeRocher executive director mm-hmm. of a recovery center here in Salt Lake called the Other Side Academy, TOSA for short. He grew mm-hmm. up in California, drug runner, prison all the time, in and out of prison, jail from the age of 13, tried suicide by cop, ran, chased by a helicopter, ran through a police barricade. Anyway, this man has totally changed his life around and now he's helping so many other individuals. When he got off stage, I went up to him after our event and I said, man, when we get back to Salt Lake, I'd love to sit down with you mm-hmm. and rack your brain because I'm just now starting my speaking career and I want to grasp the audience like you did. And I'd just like to get some yeah. tips from you. And he goes, all right. He goes, we'll, we'll make that happen. Well, this was August of 2022. Well, I didn't get a phone call from his assistant until January of 2023 last year. Mm-hmm. Hey, Dave mm-hmm. completely forgot. He's got some time. Could you come up to, to the academy and sit down with us? And, and it was a day of my show. And I said, yeah, I'll skip the gym that day and I'll come and meet with Dave. Mm-hmm. This, this man changed my life that day, Lee. Okay. He came in his office and he goes, Al, remind me again what we wanted to talk about. And I told him, and Dave is a guy that, you know, he's been in and out of prison. He's very direct and very forceful. However, he does it from here. He does it with love and respect. Yeah. yeah. And I said, yeah, Dave, I wanted some pointers about being a better speaker. And he goes, may I speak openly? And I said, yeah, you sure mm-hmm. can. He was on a chair that had rollers on it. And I was probably about four feet 
in front of him and he reached over and he grabbed my knee and he pulled himself right up to my face. He mm. says, you want to be a powerful speaker, Al? I said, yeah. He goes, you start telling your effing story instead of your wife's effing story. You got a story to tell. Mm. Let her tell. And you talked about ego. Lee, man, my ego was, I'm like, who the hell are you to talk to me this way? And and I'm backing up and I'm yeah. really starting to get irritated and, and pissed because he's pointing his finger in my face and his voice is raised and I could feel my blood just starting to curl. And then I stopped my ego. And I said, I gave this man yeah. permission to speak to me openly. I owe him that. Mm -hmm. I leaned back, listened to what he had to say. And then his assistant, Robin, who I know very well, actually started throwing her two cents in. She came from the gangs, lots of violence, drugs, alcohol. Now she's completely changed her life. Right. It so happened to be that day, Lee, Robin was my guest, my guest co-host on my show that day. Mm -hmm. After Dave literally whipped me with his love, we mm -hmm. go to the studio, we get everything mm -hmm. ready. My guest doesn't show. 20 minutes goes by of texting, calling, emailing, nothing. Robin said, Al, so I guess there's no show. And I said, no, Robin, there is a show. Mm -hmm. I said, today you're the host of my show and I'm the guest. And she's like, no, no, no way. And I says, I'm going to take Dave's advice and I'm going to share my story for the very first time. Yeah. And she's like, oh my gosh. So we did. We titled it Own Your Own Shit. That was the title of the mm. show. And mm -hmm. she interviewed me. My wife happened to come into the studio to watch me do a show, not realizing what had happened. And when she walked in and heard me telling my story for the very first time. Yeah. So what I'm trying to throw out there to people, use your voice, open up. Don't worry about the shame. Don't worry about the guilt. All that stuff is in the past and the right people will be put in your life that will help you get through it because that took a weight that I was carrying on my shoulder that I had no clue I was carrying. It dropped yeah. it like that. And Robin was able to see, she goes, Al, I was watching you throughout the show. And she goes, I was just watching you just get brighter and taller. And, and it was because I was holding on to crap that I really didn't mm. realize how much damage it was doing to me. And from that day yeah. on, from January of 2023, man, life has just taken off in a whole totally different direction, in a wonderful direction. Wow. That is an amazing story. Own your own shit. I love it. I love it. Um, we don't. I don't. All the time. You know, most of us don't. Right. Yeah. You find justifications on why it's somebody else or it's something else happened to me. And this is the reason why I do this. Right. But own your own shit. That's a that's a good takeaway lesson for yeah. this for this episode. <laughs> maybe hey, maybe so, you can title it that. <laughs> and, uh, that may be the name of this episode. Absolutely. Could be. Could be. I don't hey, know. But hey, but before we go, you know, I asked you a few questions, and you just gave an amazing story. Maybe that's the story that you want to, you know, to take away right there. But is there anything else um, that you'd like to share? And then also, where can the listeners find your podcast and and be able to connect with you, or just find out more about you? Okay, so I'll I'll start with the podcast, and I'll end it with with the question that you asked me. So, okay. I used to be found on all the major platforms since I lost my studio in March. I haven't been able to get all my shows on Spotify and Podbeam as of yet. It is coming. Mm -hmm. Just work in progress. You can find me a lot on YouTube under AR, the other side of addiction. You can also find me on Facebook under Al Richards or also AR, the other side of addiction. We've got a lot of amazing episodes from a lot of great, great people. Plus, we also have we have professionals come in that deal with mental health and trauma. It's just not all about addiction. And we also talk about different types of addiction. Um, I just had someone on my yeah. show Friday that came in and talked about his porn addiction. And we've had people come mm -hmm. on and talk about gambling addiction because, again, the brain fires the exact same way. Right. You know, and, and, as, and as far as the question that you, that you asked me, 
I mean, sharing a little bit what I just shared about owning your own shit. I, I'm just, something's just telling me to, to do this. So I've memorized a scene from a Rocky movie. Mm-hmm. And at my age, I'm pretty proud of myself that I was able to memorize it because <laughs> we're not as quick as doing that as like when we, you know, hap- when we were kids, it was pretty easy. I don't know which Rocky movie mm-hmm. it was from. <clears throat> but listen to the words carefully and understand because as we talked about when we own our own crap life takes us in a better direction so in the movie rocky's talking to his son and he goes let me tell you something you already know life ain't all sunshine and rainbows it's a very mean a nasty place Mm -hmm. and it'll beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently. If you let it, you, me or nobody is going to hit as hard as life, but it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward because that's how winning is done. So if you know what you're Mm -hmm. worth, go out and get what you're worth, but you got to be willing to take the hits. And stop pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him, her, or anybody. Because cowards do that, and that's not you. You're better than that. I think that's something. (laughs) Get up. Take those punches. How do you deal with them? That's amazing. That's amazing. So when you first heard that quote, how did that make you feel? When you first watched, when you watched the movie, you know, I didn't, maybe it didn't, maybe it did, maybe it didn't hit hard when you watched the movie the first time. Maybe it took some time later, but go ahead. Yeah. I, I didn't really see it in the movie, to be honest with you. I was, I was at a training program in 2020, oh, wow. okay. actually 2020. Yeah. And that was one of the exercise we had to get form in groups and we had to read that little section. And then they actually showed yeah. the little scene in the, uh, from the movie, uh, you know, yeah. for the whole class. And you just hit it, Lee. Really, it didn't resonate that hard to me. It, I just didn't mm-hmm. gather it until years down the road. And I happened to come across it again on social media. And I really took yeah. the time and slowed down and really listened to it because I don't know. I got a whole nother quick little story, but uh, I know you may be short on time. But anyways, um, really fast, if I if I may. Go ahead, go ahead. Last last year, last March, Lee, my daughter called me, and she goes, mm-hmm. "Dad, do you have a minute?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm just here at work, but uh, I got a minute." She goes, "I need to talk to you about something. It's something you're not going to like at this first part of it." Now, to have your daughter say she wants to have a conversation with you and you're not going to like the first part of it puts a lump in your throat. Yeah, right. She goes, Dad, when you first started your podcast, I wanted to give you 100% of my support. I wanted to support you and your show. She goes, but as time went, I didn't want to support you anymore. Can you imagine hearing that coming from one of your kids' mouth that they didn't want to support you? Now, we as parents are there to support our kids in everything and anything we possibly can. Right. And I'm like, what, what do you mean you didn't want to support your dad? She goes, dad, the more I started listening to your shows, all you did was play the victim. She Mm. goes, now you happen to be a victim because you went through a lot of crap. It goes to show with just what I just said with that little Rocky thing. Yeah. I was so busy pointing the fingers going, this is where my life's at because of you, not because of me. Yeah. I wasn't owning my own shit. Yeah. So she goes, dad, I'm in the kitchen one day. And she goes, I just happened to pull up some of your shows and I see this title, own your own shit. And I don't see your face. I see a woman's face on the screen. I'm like, where the heck's my dad? So I clicked on it and she goes, I watched the show. She goes, dad, I watched the show three times. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I called to tell you how proud I am of you for telling your story 
because my oldest daughter is probably the only personally my whole life who I've ever been 100 complete honest with. We just had that bond. Yeah. She knew why I lost my job before anybody else in the family did. She, she knew it all. Mm -hmm. For you to hear your kid tell you that they're proud of you. And that's that's something inside here, man. It really, really opens you up. And she goes, I am now one of your biggest supporters and you, I will always be (laughs) one of your biggest supporters. And again, open up. Don't be ashamed. Own your own shit. Mm. Because I tell you what, man, your life will freaking change in the, in, in such an amazing way. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Wow. Hey, thank (laughs) you. Getting me a little emotional here, Al, but (laughs) thank you for sharing uh, your powerful story and insights with, with me today. Um, Your journey through addiction and your efforts to help others are truly inspiring. And look for the listeners. I hope Al's experience and advice offer hope and encouragement. And thank you for tuning in to hindsight, the podcast. Remember understanding our past choices can help us make better decisions in the future. And join me next time as we continue to explore the path that leads to success and fulfillment. Thank you so much, Al, for that last story. Um, it was, that was, <laughs> you know, you gave me the one before the album and then you just threw the icing on the cake. Oh. <laughs> uh, that was a very impactful. And, and the reason why I say that is because you, you opened up, you owned your own shit. You checked your ego. You did this thing for you. Right. But then it had that, that secondary, that more powerful impact, you know, on your daughter as well. Uh, so that was, that's an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. No, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now, thank you for subscribing to Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.